Now it's time for On Point, where we uh, speak to experts to delve deeper into the biggest news stories in the spotlight right now. Oil prices last week hit the highest levels since October 2014, prompting renewed pledges from the Biden administration to do what it can to try and relieve prices at the pump for Americans, an issue they're very sensitive to. However, analysts see very few things that President Biden can actually do to directly affect international crude oil prices, which are the key driver, of course, of rising gasoline prices in America, but not only there, but around the world. Last Thursday, Brent crude prices briefly traded at almost 90 US dollars a barrel, while analysts, investment banks, and even some officials at uh, OPEC believe oil is headed to over $100 a barrel before too long. The problem isn't only affecting the U.S. Rising energy prices are also throwing millions of households around the world into energy poverty, with many people facing the choice between eating or heating and filling their tanks so they can get to work. For more on this problem that affects us all, we connect to Philip Van, Senior Managing Analyst at S&P Global Platts. Good morning, Philip. Uh, good morning, Morgan and Mark. Lovely to see you again. Thank you. So, firstly, um, do you think world leaders, even the U president of the U.S., have the tools to influence the oil market, which appears to be exclusively ruled by the laws of supply and demand and the whims of the OPEC Plus? Well, um, unlike the money market and fixed income securities, um, benchmark oil prices are not exactly directly controlled or influenced by any major global central banks or governments, monetary or economic policies. So. Frankly speaking, um, there's not a whole lot that global leaders can do in the short term to effectively bring prices down. Well, apart from putting pressure on the OPEC plus to boost production, I guess. But um, looking at the latest oil price rally spurred by this brewing geopolitical tensions related to the Ukraine situation, I must say um, global leaders, they can at least try not to make matters any worse here. Now, the tensions in the Eastern Europe are raising all kinds of uncertainties and market speculation that the U.S. might hit sanctions on Moscow to block Russian oil and gas sales, or perhaps even Russia might consider threatening the EU by cutting off their oil and gas supplies. But what I can point out is the fact that the actual physical market, um, Russian crude grades like Ural, so-called succulent blend crude, these cargoes are still trading as per normal without any major disruptions. And my good colleagues in the analytics department, um, they recently put out a report um, indicating that the, um, it's highly unlikely that Russia will voluntarily cut off um, large energy, energy supplies to Europe, given its desire to remain a dependable supplier and the fact that such move would unite the U.S. and Europe. So I suppose what the U.S., Europe and Russian leaders should and could do is that, um, well, they can play the game of geopolitics all they want, but make sure to give some sort of assurance to the financial and energy markets that they'll keep the politics separated from global trades and economic activity um, in a way to calm the market nerves and ease the speculated bets on higher oil prices, especially in the derivatives, futures and swaps market. Right, so forecasting which way oil prices are going to go in normal times is hard enough as it is, but especially considering the pandemic and all the other related uncertainties uh, we have at the minute. Uh, but do you agree with some analysts who say that this is just going to get worse before it gets better? And if you think that way, do you think this is going to be a long-term issue or just a temporary blip? Well, Mark, um, I can tell you price forecasting is never easy, of course. And if I was so good at forecasting oil or even stock prices, I wouldn't still be working nine to five, right? <laughs> um, but anyway, um, so is the rising prices, is this a short term thing or is this going to be a long term momentum? Um, well, if history is any lesson, um, geopolitical tensions never get resolved overnight. And it typically takes months, sometimes years to settle down and come to a peaceful conclusion. I mean, you look back uh, for Iranian nuclear talks last year, for example. Um, at one point, the talks were seemingly progressing well, but it's back to a standstill once again, right? Now, as far as the global um, energy supply is concerned, well, the overall global supply condition will probably remain tight at least throughout the first half of 2022. 
Now, because um, OPEC Plus is not expected to boost the pace and scale of its current production hike strategy, while many of the smaller OPEC producers are actually struggling to meet their production quotas um, due to the lack of investment in not just new upstream projects, but also lack of CAPEX spending just to maintain the current production capacity. And finally, in terms of demand, um, the Omicron variant um, has proved to be less deadly than the earlier Delta variant. And its impact on global oil demand is not as significant as the prior variant. So now um, jet fuel, aviation fuel is probably the last missing piece for the full oil demand recovery to pre-pandemic levels. Now, if we somehow see the full revival in the global aviation and the tourism industry, um, that's certainly going to play a big price supporting factor too at some stage in 2022. Um, so overall, high oil prices are likely to stay for a while, um, say at least several more months. But Philip, given that this is a, such a big issue in the West, why don't the US and Canada, both of which stand on enormous oil reserves um, just start turning on their pumps to full capacity to counter the actions of OPEC plus? I'll, I'll tell you this, um, there is a structural underinvestment and global upstream capital expenditure has been very lackluster ever since the financial crisis back in 2008. Now, there were several instances, of course, of major oil price crash over the past 10, 15 years. And there were also multiple phases or price trend in the past decade where prices were simply hovering below the $40, $50 mark, which would be under the break-even price level for many small and medium upstream businesses. Now, this was very much the case for major non-OPEC producers too, like the US and Canada. Um, but again, because of the structural underinvestment and lagging CAPEX spending over the past several years, um, production increase cannot just simply occur overnight just like that. And especially for Canada, um, after such a strong pledge to become net carbon zero, right, um, doing fossil fuel business is very expensive and not so much profitable over there. And it's, it's not a lot of impetus for upstream companies to expand their projects in Canada. And finally, just touching on that point before we let you go uh, about uh, all these countries pledging to go net carbon zero by 2050. Do you think to some extent uh, many Western governments feel like their hands are tied because they are kind of concerned about really upsetting uh, not only environmentalists, but also uh, this just has become a hot but an issue for a great many voters in those countries? Um, not quite. Um, I wouldn't exactly say the current crisis of tight supply and production shortage is due to the oil companies or governments fearing a backlash of criticism from the environmentalists, as you say. It's, not, it's nothing like that, to be honest. Um, to be fair, oil producers and refiners around the world have actually been stepping up efforts and making stellar progress to minimize their carbon footprint um, by adopting carbon capture technology, for example, in both crude oil and middle distillate fuel production phases. Um, now, what I can highlight is two main reasons that may have led to the current high supply conditions. Um, one is the oil industry has been massively under investing to meet future supply due mainly to economic reasons that I've mentioned earlier. Now, the second reason is that um, I believe the global oil industry may have underestimated the long-term future of oil demand and somewhat ended up neglecting on CAPEX spending in the past decade or so. I mean, let's face it, um, despite the growing focus towards clean energy, um, it looks like oil will continue to be the major energy source for the world for at least next two decades, um, especially considering the slow pace of energy transition in many developing countries. Now, until now to 2050, there are going to be an estimated 2 billion more energy users in the world, and the population growth will be led by the developing countries, right? Where energy transition will be much slower and consumers there generally won't be able to afford expensive new clean energy. So the majority of the world population will likely depend on oil as a major energy source for around 10, 20 years more. All right, Philip, thank you so much for your insights. Hope to talk to you again soon.
Yeah, it was a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you.